from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. To quote our featured author, Chef John Moeller, how cool is this? And how cool was his job? John Moeller is a member of an elite corps of chefs, those who've served in the White House preparing meals and special dinners for first families and their guests, including visiting heads of state. Chef John is unique in that he worked across three consecutive administrations, President George Herbert Walker Bush, President William Jefferson Clinton, and President George W. Bush. He shares his most memorable moments at the executive mansion, plus scores of recipes in this new book, Dining at the White House, From the President's Table to Yours. It is my pleasure to introduce someone I've had the opportunity to meet at Channel 9, Chef John Moeller. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate You're that. Welcome. Good to see you again. It's, it's, great. it's a great honor to be here, especially for this is the first year that they have had these type of cooking demos. And I'd also like to thank my former boss, uh, f former First Lady uh, Laura Bush, for getting all these uh, book, book festivals started here in Washington, D.C. What I had the opportunity to do in my book here is I took all the official recipes that we used to use for official functions at the White House, and every time we did a dinner, we would never really ever repeat it again. So my biggest challenge as a chef there was coming up with new menu items on a regular basis. So what I came up for this recipe that's in the book also, and it's from a, um, it's from a state luncheon with uh, the president of Indonesia, it's a herb crusted chicken. And what the herbs are, it's called fine herbs or fine herbs. I spent about two and a half years in France working during the mid 80s, and I came to love these mixture of herbs there. They are uh, chives, tarragon, uh, Italian parsley, and sherbet. Unfortunately, I didn't have any shrivel with me today here, but the combination of those four herbs gives what's referred to as fine herbs. You couldn't put rosemary, you can't put thyme, and those type of stronger herbs in something like this to, to give this unique flavor. So what I do is I'm gonna take the, um, the chives, and chives are really easy to cut because they're nice and straight, and you can go right through. The most important thing is to have a nice sharp knife. What I do is I kinda cut and chop a little bit of the, um, the chives here. Once that's all done, I'm gonna take uh, fresh tarragon. Is there, everybody familiar with what tarragon is? You don't see it that often out there, but I really enjoy the flavor. It has a nice astringent background to it, and it adds a nice definition to what, what I wanna do here. So we, we take the stem here, just pull back on the leaves, and just get those nice tender leaves. The, um, the stem, you do not want to chop that and eat that part of it. It's, it's a little bit too tough. After we get a, a couple of these guys pulled apart, then there again too, we chop this up. And what I'll do is I'll chop all these in the same equal amounts, and then we'll mix them all together. I like to chop them separately, because each one chops differently when you chop them by themselves, and then afterwards mix and give them a little chopping once they're all done. And it's always good to try and chop your herbs just before you're going to use them. Because the, the aromatics, the parfum, the perfume that's inside the herb, it just explodes with flavor as you're chopping it. I wouldn't want to chop this in the morning and then use it in the evening because some of that aromatics is going to leave and it's not going to be quite as strong. So, so, so we've got that. And then the other part is Italian parsley. There again too, we just pick the tender leaves off away from the stem. And there again, too, what I like to do, with, especially with parsley, I take, push, bunch it up into a ball in your finger here, and then I push it up against the knife there, and then put nice thin slices through it. By starting off this way, you're going to be able to get a nicer chopped parsley. If you just lay it across the board and just start chopping at it, it's going to take you a lot longer to get it nicely chopped up. Excellent, you know. So we got, so we got the four herbs. There it's. Parsley, Italian parsley I prefer. There is also curly parsley. Curly parsley is good for decorations and some other things, but I really don't care for the flavor for uh, chopping up and adding it into foods like what we're going to do today here. So I like the Italian parsley. It has a little cleaner flavor to it. All right. So what we're going to do is going to take a little pile of the uh, it's parsley. We have the tarragon and the chives. Like I said, the only one that's missing is sherbet. 
the, the recipe is in the book as Sherville, but also do realize that it's very, very hard to find that out in the supermarkets. It'd be Safeway, Giant, uh, Whole Foods. It's very difficult to find any of the, uh, the Sherville in the marketplace. I can buy it professionally through my produce guys, but that's, that's about it. And one of the main reasons is because it's very, uh, a little bit unknown, but it's very perishable. It, 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 uh, it collapses on it and wilts very quickly. All right, so now we have all the herbs. And if you can smell this, it just has such a nice aromatic smell to it right now. All right. So what I did, <clears throat> when I got the ideal to do this was when I was going to do this chicken recipe, and, I, and you always hear the old saying that, you know, a thousand ways to cook a chicken. Well, I found a thousand and two ways to cook a chicken because chicken was a very popular protein at the White House, and we were always constantly trying to figure out what to do with it. So I thought one day that I would take an ideal of taking the chicken breast. This is a skinless, boneless lobe of chicken breast, the white meat. I lightly pounded it out already so that the, t the, the thick end is tapped down a little bit, so it equals with the thin end. So now it will cook a little more evenly. If you don't do that, this side's a little fatter, and this becomes overcooked on this side, and down here is, and you can see it's pretty, pretty even on how you're looking at it this way here, that it, uh, it'll cook a lot more evenly for you. So what we're gonna do is, I like cooking with sea salt. We'll put a little bit of sea salt and black pepper in some all-purpose flour. We're gonna take this, and mix it together, just to season flour. Then we're gonna take our chicken breast here and just put it on what is referred to as the skin side of the chicken. I'm only putting the flour on the one side. And I'm gonna shake off all the excess. I don't want it all clumped up there. All I want is enough flour on here to make the next part happen, which is the egg white. So we'll take both of these pieces and always remember, when working with chicken, you have to worry about food safety. You know, don't want to intermix. You don't want to be cutting on a cutting board that you were just cutting the uh, herbs on without properly cutting <coughs> and washing and sanitizing it. Now, in this bowl here, I have uh, egg white. So I just cracked one egg white, whipped it up lightly, and I'm going to take the chicken breast, put it through the egg white, and then that'll, that's what's going to give me the opportunity to have the herbs stick to that. And like I said, remember, this side here doesn't have the flour. This side does. So I'm going to put this through like this. And now I will get all the excess uh, egg white off it. I don't want it running and being too gooey with it. Here again, and I don't want to saturate the herbs either. I want, I want just enough flour to make the egg white stick. I want just enough egg white to make the herb stick. And, it, and like I said, it's only on the one side. So put that in there. It's just nice working with tongs and stuff like that with here. At least the stuff's not getting all bunched up on your fingers. All right. Okay. So now we have our chicken breast here. This is the skin side. Underneath is like where the tenderloin is. We didn't do anything with that side yet. Now we take our herbs, the fiend herbs, and we're going to sprinkle it across the chicken breast. You can see how hot my plate. And she's pretty hot there. I'll turn it up just a little bit. And I don't like to pat it down. I just like to kind of sprinkle it across a nice even amount. And it takes a little bit of the, of the herbs there. But more of the herbs, the better. And what I... <clears throat> Everybody's always looking for some healthy eating to do here, and just cooking this by itself is, um, is fine just on its own here. I'm going to be serving something called a uh, beurre blanc with it. That's what we did at the White House. And it's a very, uh, very classically known uh, a sauce called uh, white butter sauce or beurre blanc, as they refer to in France. What I will do is I took, you can take almost any kind of oil, canola oil possibly, olive oil maybe not so because it has a lower burn temperature, but what I do have here today is some clarified butter. Clarified butter is where when you melt the butter, the impurities fall to the bottom, the white liquidy part, the weight, and then the clear uh, yellow oil, which is clarified butter. We're going to put this into the pan, and the pan has to be decently hot. You, you want a nice medium-high temperature. 
So when this herb, the herb side is what I'm going to put in the pan first, when that comes in contact with that oil, it has to immediately start to cook the proteins of the egg white and create that crust. If the temperature is not hot enough, it's not going to do that. It's going to stick to the pan. But on the other hand, too, you don't want it smoking hot when, and it's going to overcook it. You don't want to brown it too much either. So you got to get a nice medium, medium high temperature. There we go. That looks good. And you don't want to crowd the pan too much. This is pretty good just as it is, the size pan with these two breasts. You can see it's frying nicely. Yep, it's releasing. I use a non-stick pan for something like this here. Let it create its crust on the one side now. And then on the underside, we'll just put a little bit of salt and pepper. Like that. If you're salt sensitive, you don't, you don't have to put the salt on it, but a little bit's good. The two types of salts I like to work with is sea salt and kosher salt. They kind of give the best flavor. If you would ever do a side-by-side -side tasting of all those salts and then also put like the iodized table salt that you normally have at home, you'll really taste the difference. The iodized salt really does not have a very good flavor. While that's cooking, in this pan here, we're gonna start our beurre blanc, our butter sauce. We're gonna take a white wine, Chardonnay, you would like a, dr a dry white wine for something like this. We're gonna put that in the pan here. I already started to get it warm. And we're gonna make a reduction with it. Turn that up a little bit. And the other thing we have to add to it is some shallots. So I take the shallots, if everybody's familiar with what a shallot is, it's in the onion family. It's a small, more intense flavored onion. I'm going to just do a quick julienne on the one side. Put that in there like that. We're gonna take some peppercorns. Just a couple whole black peppercorns in there. And a bay leaf or two, depending on the size. We'll probably put like two bay leaves in there. Put another small one in there. And all we're going to do is cook and reduce that down. If you use a sweeter wine, when it reduces down, it doesn't taste good. It gets too concentrated with the sweetness. All right, now get, keep an eye in here. It's, get, it's getting a nice crust here. It's a good temperature. I'm actually might need to turn it up just a little bit. And <clears throat> so when it's cooked down the dry white wine there, when it concentrates, it really gives a nice great flavor on, on the back end of it. So after it reduces down, we're going to put in some heavy cream. But we have to wait a little bit before we do that. So that's, this is pretty much the whole thing. Pretty easy to do. You think you can do this at home? Yes? <laughs> okay. So we're going to let that uh, cook for a moment or two. We're going to let this guy reduce down a little bit here. I'm going to keep a close eye on it. I like to do, yeah, this one's ready to go. Okay, we're going to flip that over. You should be able to see, see how it's nice and green? If the, temp if the temperature's too hot, it's going to brown, and we don't want to do that. It's going to take away from that nice green color. So, all right, so we got that on this side here. Give that a moment or two. Like I said, this is one of the recipes out of my book here. I have 107 recipes in there. Sometimes I like to do a little reading. I have a moment or two, and since everybody else is doing readings, why shouldn't I, you know? So, so this was a letter that was sent to Mrs. Clinton back in 1999 or so. It says, uh, October 26, 1999. Hillary Rodden Clinton, the White House, Washington, D.C. Dear Mrs. Clinton, how very kind of you to host a luncheon for all of us the other day in your beautiful White House. I have been there several times, starting with the LBJ administration, where everything was beautifully handled. Got to still keep an eye on the pan here. During subsequent visits, I was not as impressed. But when I returned for the Sarah Lee Frontrunners Awards luncheon, I was delighted to find the White House sparkling, the service beautiful and attentive, and the food delicious. It was a very heartwarming experience. Thank you so much. With all good wishes, Julia Child. 
not too bad of a day there. I had no idea. I mean, every day we're serving, you know, kings, queens, dignitaries. And 15 minutes before uh, lunch started, somebody came down to the kitchen and said that Julie Child's there for lunch. And I was like, I was a little struck in at the moment, but we were already in the mode to get ready to do lunch for 130 people. Not much I thought about what I was doing and should I change anything. And I said, no, everything's cool. We're, we're just going to kind of keep on going here, you know. So we, we served lunch. Everything went off very nicely. Afterwards, uh, Mrs. Clint, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Child came down to the kitchen and uh, she wanted to thank us for a nice luncheon. So one of the chefs happened to have a uh, camera and took a shot of it with her. The uh, social secretary enjoyed the, um, the, the meal so much when, the, when the, she, she took the plate that the butler had in her hand there, dropped it on a table in the red, red room, and then took a shot of it. So the White House photographer gave me the picture of it the next day or so. Uh, a week or so later, one of the ushers in the usher's office said, hey, John, didn't you do, that was your lunch you did last week. I said, yeah. And at the time, we would divide up the lunches. Not one chef would work all the lunches. So we get a real busy period, and we can be. We can be doing, you know, it's, it's a home. Remember, it's, it's a pretty good home, pretty good public housing for the most part, you know. But you have to serve uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to the president, the first lady, their family, and their guests. But also, it's a banquet house. We're serving all types of things from breakfasts, lunches, dinners, to the first family and his family and friends on a daily, uh, daily basis also. So one of the ushers said, hey, that was your menu. I said, sure. And he said, yeah, you might want to see this. So he showed me the letter I just read. And I said, my, can I uh, take a photocopy of that? He said, sure. And he said, here's the other letter. It was the letter that Mrs. Clinton was writing back to Miss Child, thanking her for her comments. And so obviously I got a picture of a uh, photocopy of that also. And we decided to start the book off with this, with this story. And um, we thought it was a good prelude into everything that we wanted to present to people on my time at the White House. Yeah. I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, just two hours north. Uh, went to culinary school when I was uh, young, about, uh, about eight, actually about 17 when I went to, off to college. Okay, this guy's just about ready. And I, I always feel the chicken when it starts to firm up. There's always something to see. If you, if you take your finger and just kind of keep your hand kind of limp and do this, it's kind of soft, that's when the meats are kind of rare. And as it cooks, and make a little bit of a fist, it, and it tightens up, it becomes more cooked. And you make a fist and you feel it firm, that's what meat feels like when it's cooked all the way through. So that gives me a little indication. The smaller one here is just about done. This one over here is a little softer. He needs a little bit longer time there. But we are just about done there with that. So I went to culinary school. I, uh, afterwards, in the mid 80s, I had a friend of mine that was living in Paris and cooking. He kept bugging me to come on over and visit him. So in uh, July of 84, I, I bought a one-way ticket to Europe, uh, went over and met my friend over there, gave up my job, just threw a backpack on, and I figured, let's, let's see what happens. Well, everybody thought I was crazy. They're like, yeah, what, do you got, what do you got planned over there? Do you have a, a job lined up? Uh, you're, you're, you don't speak that very good English, uh, French or anything like that. I said, ah, we'll figure it out, figure it out. They said, ah, we'll see you back in three weeks. Well, two and a half years later, I came back to America, and I, I learned a culture, a way of life, and it was just a great time of discovery to see all these great things. I mean, you can say what you want about the French, but they, they love their food, and every region has a very distinct way of how they treat their food. And, and that's where I got some of these ideals. It, these, these mixed herbs here, one chef used to use it to make one of his pate terrines. And I always liked that flavor. And so when I was coming to think of making the, a chicken dish, something a little bit different one time, I said, how about if I take those herbs and do something and create a crust for it? And I just made it up, did it, and it was a big hit. They absolutely loved it. I, I got a comment back later on saying that was just a nice, clean tasting piece of chicken there that, um, that, that was uh, a little bit different from what's normally out there. And something else that's very French is this uh, beurre blanc, or white butter sauce. But after spending about two and a half years in France, I came back, I found work down the Virgin Islands, I worked down St. Croix for about a year. And upon returning back to the States here, I landed in DC, and that was in 87. And um, I kind of fell in love with it. I kind of loved the international flavor that this, this city has to offer. I found work the very first day I was looking for. It was a, a sh uh, restaurant off DuPont Circle. And right now it's the Church of Scientology, but it used to be called the Four Ways Restaurant. And I was there in 87, 88, and 89. And the chef there at the time was French-Belgian. He saw the places I worked in France and wanted to bring me on, so I started to work with them. Three weeks later, 
uh, after service on a Friday night, he said, uh, what, what are you doing tonight? I said, nothing. He said, why don't you come with me? All the French chefs in Washington get together once in a while, and tonight's the night. If you want, you can come along. He said, your French is good enough. You can hang with him. So I went down and met all the French chefs down at the Mayflower Hotel. Afterwards, uh, this one gentleman named Pierre Chambrin, he was the chef at the Maison Blanche restaurant at the time, and uh, we became friends. And over the next year or two, we would talk about different opportunities in the city. Then I heard he was working at the White House. I said, that's pretty cool, Pierre's at the White House. About two years later, uh, I get a call from him saying that, uh, that he's at the White House and he's up for the chef position and he's looking for somebody to take his place as sous chef. I said, let's talk, you know, I'm, up, I'm interested. So we went to, we, when we sat down to talk about, the, uh, talk, talk about the position, he said that there's five chefs in the kitchen of the White House, full timers. There's two in the pastry and three in the kitchen. I'd be the number two person in the kitchen. He says, I'm French born, but you have to be an American citizen to work full time at the White House. He says, the, the pastry chef is French born and also American citizen. He says, I could bring another Frenchman in that's an, that's an American citizen, but I think it's too many French people. He says, if I could find an American that knew something about French cooking is what I'm looking for. So that little séjour in France is what set me apart from the other candidates at that point in time and got me in. And so it was, a, it was a, it, when the, the day I actually got the job and I walked out of the map room, as was referred to, and, and got dumped out on East Executive Boulevard, I just, I just pinched myself. I couldn't believe that, uh, that I'm actually going to be walking through these gates every single day coming to work. And it was a great honor and a privilege to be able to walk through and go into the White House and get catapulted up to the second floor of the White House and being close to the families. You know, both, like I said, the Bushes, the Clintons and the Bushes. We had a great close relationship with them between the chefs, the butlers, and the maids. We we're probably the closest ones to them. And the, the, the best part about it was that we got a chance to see them in a completely different light than everybody else. Politics had nothing to do with what we did. We just wanted to make their stay as comfortable as possible while they're living in that fishbowl. And so when you're up on that second floor, you would never, ever, ever talk about politics. So you would talk about, you know, how, you know, how the weather's like, you know, how, how great the Redskins are and things like that, you know, but that's, that's about it, you know. So it was, it was great to have that type of relationship with them, you know. It brings, <laughs> can, can you imagine what the most interesting day, the most unusual day at the White House is? Mm -hmm. The day of inauguration. What it takes to get a president out and bring another one in is just extraordinary, you know. And at uh, 9.30 in the morning on Inauguration Day, when uh, George H.W. Bush is just getting the, ready to leave, they called us up to the uh, state dining room. And in the White House, there's about 80 some of us, 80 plus who are resident staff, you know, plumbers, electricians, uh, carpenters, florists, uh, calligraphers. We're all part of the, the team that takes care of the White House on a daily basis. So we're all standing in a circle in the state dining room and all of a sudden the big mahogany doors open up coming from the cross hall into the state dining room and then the doors shut and the president first lady uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, Mrs. Barbara Bush come on in and um, they, they looked at us and President Bush head had dro dropped down he's staring at the floor for a moment he, his head swung back and forth for a moment and he said you know of all the goodbyes that we had to say this is going to be the toughest one because all you people have taken care of us for the last four years and we can't say thanks enough Boy, there wasn't a dry in the whole place, you know. They, they, were, they were very gentle, nice, nice people. And, and then it, that's when it really hit me. It was like, wow, these people, they're leaving us now here, you know. And um, we, had a, we, we traded off some fun stories about the dogs and the pets and the horseshoe games that we'd have out in the back or what have you. The president liked playing horseshoes with the staff from time to time, you know. He'd call us up and say, hey, I'm ready to throw some shoes here, you know. And so we had, we had some fun times with that. And then before you know it, they leave the state dining room, the doors open, they leave. You look out in the front uh, driveway, there's moving trucks out there, uh, getting ready to take the President Bush's belongings away from the White House. There's moving trucks behind them, bringing the Clinton stuff in. And between 10 o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the afternoon, it's insane. The amount of work goes on and getting the, the Oval Office broken down, getting everything set up the way he wants it, getting things in place to a degree so they can be ready to walk in that White House at uh, five o'clock. And that evening, we don't really do a dinner there because of all the inaugural balls that are all around the city. So we have like a little grazing buffet up on the third floor in the solarium, which is right above. This guy is looking pretty good now. She's reduced down. After this reduces down about 90%, then we're going to take heavy cream, not light cream or half and half and definitely not milk. And we're going to pour that in and we're going we're to reduce that down now. 
All right, we'll turn that up a little bit and let that boil. And so I'm, I'm up on the third floor doing this little buffet, just having food ready for anybody who might need a snack or something before they go out at 7 o'clock to the inaugural balls. And then all around the, around the corner comes President Clinton. And he's charging around, taking the look at the White House for the very first time. And he comes over and introduced myself to him. And, uh, and I said, wow, this is pretty extraordinary. You know, I, I say goodbye to one president in the morning and say hello to the new one at night. And the best thing about it is that there's not a shot that's been fired. You know, in, in, in the world that we live in here, it's a peaceful transition of power. And we can never forget that. Uh, we're going to let that reduce down a little bit. How are we doing, Tom? Can we, uh, st we can start some uh, question and answers. Does anybody have a, a question or so? Yes, ma'am. And speak up a little bit, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, come, come closer to me. I'm sorry about that. Your aunt? Uh-huh. Hi, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you were baking or making a soup, would you just throw the stems in and remove them before you serve the food? Well, um, I would use the stems only if I was making like a stock and I'm drawing flavor from it. In fact, like these stems and things, I would hold on to them sometimes. If I'm making a lobster stock, I like to use uh, tarragon stems and what have you. If I'm making chicken stock, I use like the uh, parsley stems and what have you, chives. All those type of flavors good for that, for aromatics there. But when I'm chopping it fine like this, see how fine that is? Mm -hmm. And you can see each piece of that fine leaf there. If the stem's in there, it looks chunkier. It's not as clean, so it's a matter of also taking it to the next level at, at my level of cooking to make it look nice. Yes, it can work, but at our level, we want to make it just as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question out there? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Mm -hmm. Can you share a favorite dish that each family had, that each mm -hmm. um, president had that you prepared? Yeah, you know, she was asking about a favorite dish that the, f uh, the families all enjoyed. You know, <clears throat> of course, we had two, two sides of what I did. We, um, I, I cooked personally for them and also for the state dinners and what have you. But when, when I cooked for them personally, I felt like I was more like a dietitian more than a chef because when they actually ate on their own, they were very health conscious. All of them were. And because when they're out on the road, they're exposed to a lot of heavy caloric foods. When they're in the White House eating state dinners, they're exposed to a lot of heavy foods. So when they eat on their own, they're, they're very, very health conscious, you know. So I come up with a couple recipes that would be more clean tasting, you know, and not too heavy. And actually one that they all really enjoyed was, um, I kept a pretty good recipe for chicken enchiladas, you know. And um, it's, it's good. When it's done right, it's good. Even when you make your own fresh tortillas, it was great, you know. One time, the, uh, just after George W. Bush came into office, I thought I'd do some fajitas one night for dinner. And so I was doing lunch and dinner that day. Mrs. Bush came back into the kitchen, and there, there's two kitchens in the White House. Down on the ground floor of the kitchen, of that White House, is our main kitchen, where we would uh, do our main work and do hard prep and cooking there. Then we take everything up to the second floor kitchen. Second floor kitchen, if you look at the White House from Pennsylvania Avenue, the, the, the first floor is all the green room, red room, state dining rooms. The second floor, far right window, is the kitchen I'd be working in when we're serving the family. And then the butlers would give us the plates that were needed, go through a swinging door, and the dining room's right next to them. So that's the corner of the house that I would be in most of the time. So I'm up there after lunch, and Mrs. Bush came back and thanked me for a nice lunch. And I said, well, just let you know, tonight I was thinking about doing fajitas. She goes, so what do you have for ingredients? So I explained all the guacamole and onions and pa poblanos and everything I had. She said, everything sounds good, but we don't eat flour tortillas. We're from Texas. We eat corn tortillas, and we prefer to have fresh ones. And I said, well, uh, I've never made fresh ones before, but I'll, uh, I'll look into it. She says, she pointed to her housekeeper that she brought up from, uh, uh, from Texas. Her name was Maria, Mexican lady. And uh, she, she said, Maria will show you how to make it. She looked, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. So she came down with me to the kitchen. I cleaned up real quick. We got a van, drove over to uh, Adams Morgan, picked up the, the flour, Mesaca flour, got the press and everything. She came back, gave me a demo. And uh, within a week or two, I could bang out some pretty good amount of tor tortillas there. And when you make them fresh, it's, it's amazing how much flavor they have, you know? And it's like eating fresh bread. It's a lot of times, even on a, just a basic, like a, a, a Tex-Mex type meal, half an hour before I go up and serve dinner, I'll make some fresh corn tortillas and just kind of keep them with a cloth on top of them and serve it to them, and they, they, it is very, very good. They're nice and pliable, you know? They like making tacos out of them too. 
uh, instead of having you know, hard shells, they don't really, never served a hard shell taco when I was there. It was always soft, uh, soft fresh made tortillas, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else there? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Good morning. What Good morning. was your most challenging meal or event and how did you save it? Uh, challenging, we would get it from time to time. You know, when we have foreign dignitaries come in to the White House, I would wait for the, um, the State Department would forward us dietary restrictions of, of the visiting head of state. I would always wait to, to read that before I would uh, start writing a menu. Anytime I got ahead of myself and, and started writing a menu, they would like something different, you know? I think one of the most unusual ones I ever saw was about 10 years ago or so, had the Prime Minister of Italy come in, and I was reading the dietaries, and it said, does not eat onions, garlic, and tomatoes. I read it five times to make sure it didn't say put extra in. I was like, you gotta be kidding me, he's, a, he's an imposter, so, so let me check him out there, you know? I, I came to a realization maybe afterwards, just my guess, that, that I think he, everywhere he goes, probably people load onions, garlic, and tomatoes into his food, and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm tired of that stuff, you know, well, I wanna go out and eat something else, so he, I think he probably, I think that might make sense to a degree, because they, they wouldn't let him in Italy if he didn't eat that, you know what I mean? It's, it's <laughs> Anybody else? This side of the room, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. What did you make for the Italian ambassador? What did you end up making for the Italian ambassador? Fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you what it didn't have was onions, garlic, and tomatoes in it, you know? I read that thing like five times. I was like, I cannot be reading it. My eyes telling me what I'm seeing here, you know? <laughs> But, uh, but actually, we do like some fried chicken from time to time. But do like the oven fried, uh, marinate it up a little bit, and put it on a roasting rack, and I bake it off in the oven. And the things like that are good from time to time. I remember one time, uh, late 90s, Clintons were already in there for a couple of years, and it was a cold winter night in February. And I was trying to think of there again, too, what else can I do with a piece of chicken there? And I thought about a chicken pot pie recipe that comes from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it doesn't have the crust on it. You make a dumpling dough, you roll it out, you cut it up, and then you cook it into the stock. And so it's, it's more like a stew type thing. So I, I made the chicken pot pie recipe. I put it up there and I was standing up in that second floor kitchen, uh, just served it, so I'm waiting for the, the next course to go out. And then this, the door opened up into the dining room. And I see President Clinton there leaning over the bowl like this with a fork and he looks up to me and goes, John, this is the kind of food I like. I said, all right, and then Mrs. Clinton actually was standing next to him, and she looked down, and she goes, let's make a few biscuits with that next time. I said, absolutely. So that became one of the rotation things. You know, we probably, we weren't up on the second floor serving personally. We probably, every three weeks or so, we'd probably bring back a favorite, you know. I mean, you can't come up with something new every single day, but there again, too, you try things from time to time. So, of course, President Clinton left, and George W. Bush was up there one day, and uh, he was having dinner by himself. And... There again, too. I said, let me try the uh, chicken pot pie recipe. And I kid you not, same thing happened. The door opened up. I was standing there. He was there. He was leaning over the bowl, eating it like this. And he looked up and he said, John, this is the kind of food I like. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, you know. It's, uh, comfort food is still comfort food. And if it's well pre prepared and you're using fresh ingredients, that's what's important, too, you know. You know? No, no, none of those things really had a lot of fat in it. I mean, I'm not pouring cream in it, lots of butter, what have you. But it's, uh, when it's well prepared, just like the chicken enchiladas with a tomato sauce there, there there's nothing bad about that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh-huh. Well, I, I'm not allowed to have anybody taste it, but since you did say about the resting part, it is important though. When I take something out of the pan like this, I don't like to just take it out, put it on the plate, and then serve it to you. You want to let it rest a little bit. Even if it's a small piece of chicken like this, maybe five plus minutes or so, that lets the juices calm down, because they're all kind of actively moving around inside the meat there. Let it relax. Sometimes you'll see liquid come out down below. Let that do it on its own. If you slice into it and you see juices moving, that's not a good thing. That's when the juices are really going to exit the meat and it becomes more drier. So it's very good to, uh, to do that that way. I'm going to take the smaller one here, though, what I was going to do, and slice it this way. And just so you know, <coughs> there's a right way and a wrong way to cut a piece of chicken. I mean, it seems pretty tender, though, but the grain runs towards the wing joint. So you can see where the slice is here, where the wing joint was cut off. You want to cut against that. So I always look for where the wing joint is, and then I take it, and I slice in this direction here. 
If the grains are going this way, you want to cut across the grain. I also wait for this guy here. This one, now, when I see the cream reduced down, this has been boiling. I mean, it hasn't broken. I think you can get a kind of a view of this here. It's starting to get heavy. The bubbles are getting larger. That's a good signal to me. What I'm going to do now is going to take some butter. And I'm going to take some butter here, soft butter, room temperature, unsalted butter. And I'm going to start slowly whipping this in here. And there's no way around this. Yes, there's calories in this. But you don't eat this every day. You know? This has a great flavor. It, has, has, it goes very well like chicken dishes and fish dishes and what have you. But it's like what I believe is eating a balanced diet. You, know? you don't eat this stuff every day, but if once in a while you make a nice sauce for a nice dinner with some friends and what have you, make a beurre blanc. Enjoy it there. You know? Don't drink a cup of it, but you know, an ounce or so is fine. You know? so it's, it's very important that the butter's been sitting out all morning, and then so when it goes in and you're constantly whipping, it, it, it emulsifies. It, it melts and emulsifies into the sauce. And afterwards, it can come up to just a very gentle boil. You want to be able to heat up all the butter that's in there. We're going to take a fresh lemon. Squeeze a little lemon juice in there. It was unsalted butter, so we're going to put a little bit of sea salt in there, a little bit of pepper. Mix this all up like this. All right. So take this, turn that off now. That's, that's our white wine butter sauce. So we reduced the white wine with the shallots and the bay leaves. You can put a piece of thyme in there if you want, the peppercorns. Cook that down by 90%, reduce it, add the heavy cream, boil that down probably over half, and then whip in the... Um, Whip in the, uh, the softened butter. Afterwards, we can, take this, we can take some of the sauce here, put it on the plate. We take our chicken here. Put it across the sauce there. Just kind of open it up a little bit, like this here. You do it like that, so you get the nice green from the, um, from the herbs there, and then you have the white butter sauce, and of course the white meat for the chicken there, gives it a nice, um, a nice appearance there. I, I wish you would be able to taste this, but it has a very unique flavor. That those fine herbs really does accentuate it. And it, what I do a lot of times is I, I make this dish like this, but I, I, uh, after I cook it, I let it cool down, I'll slice it room temperature and put it on salads, like a couscous salad, or, or, or do like a, like a chilled luncheon type thing. And it's just fine by itself like that with a nice, uh, nice flavorful salad next to it. What do you think there? You think you can do this at home? All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I love cooking. And you know, one thing I love to do is go to the market and just not with anything in mind, just kind of see what's there, what looks good, and kind of create something. But a lot of times I like to try and find something where I can cook it all in one pan, you know? Slice and dice everything, almost like kind of a stir-fry thing, and, and, and enjoy those type of things. I, I like all types of foods, you know? Uh, seafood, if it be, or, or ch chicken, or, or, or braised meats. I mean, it's nice having like a piece of filet, and I enjoy that from time to time, but it's something about taking a subcut of meat and cooking it out and braising it, making a sauce from the braising liquids, and then putting that back over top of the meat there, I think that's, that's real cooking to me, you know? And that's one of the reasons like, like braised short ribs are so popular out there, because that, that's what that is. It's, it's that, that good comfort food that's very well, uh, when, it's, when it's very well prepared, it tastes delicious. Mm -hmm. How are we? John Moeller, please thank John Moeller. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we want to let you know, make sure you have the bookmark, because there's a wonderful recipe on there, on your bookmarks, on the back of the bookmark. And then if you want the recipe for the herb crusted chicken, there are people handing out the uh, recipes if you don't have them. So make sure you hold up your hand so you can get that. And then if you'd like to meet Chef John, get a copy of his book. You see to your left, book signings. He will be there from 12 until 1 p.m., line 14. So he'll be able to maybe give you more secret behind the scenes of cooking at the White House. Thank you very much for being with us. Keep your hands up to make sure you get the recipe for the herb crusted chicken. And Chef John, thank you so much for being thank here. You. It's a pleasure. Thank pleasure you, Andrea. to see you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. 
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.